Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Eileen and Maura. We're obviously humbled by uh, those very, very kind words. Um, welcome, everyone, both physically and virtually. Uh, we're going to go on one of those rides where we, you, I'm going to urge you to fasten your seatbelts. We're going to head straight up to 30,000 feet, and we're going to be doing a lot of acrobatics uh, during the next uh, three hours. We want to have as much uh, feedback dialogue as possible. We're going to try and protect time for your feedback. So I'm going to launch straight in and start with really an overview of what, a, what is the, the research, not so much the capacity building that we take so seriously, but that's not what we're focusing on today. We're going to focus on the research. So what, is, what are we trying to address? Well, the problem, in a simple statement, um, pulled out of a Guatemala USA portfolio review is essentially we can grow more food, we can add more income at the household level that doesn't always or automatically translate into improved nutrition. That's been recognized both globally, it's recognized at the country level, it's recognized <coughs> at the mission level. And that means we need to figure out what else can be done and how can we leverage the growing more food and the access to more income to achieve the nutrition goals we want to achieve. Some of the work we're doing is at very global scale. This is work on food consumption, actual dietary patterns, and all I want to show is that over time, uh, this is for Feed the Future countries uh, between two time periods, you can have countries like Ethiopia moving to the right, which is higher income, and downwards, which is less stunting. Uh, so you can see Ethiopia moving in the direction we would like it to move in. You can see Uganda moving in the direction to the right and down in terms of income relationship with stunting. You can see Ghana moving quite nicely to the right and down. But there are many other countries that don't fit that pattern. Actually, Nepal hasn't increased its income dramatically over that period, but has reduced stunting significantly. Therefore, there are things to learn in that context. And we have other countries like Guatemala, we just saw, that have relatively higher income but are not making much progress uh, on the stunting. So we, we need to tease out what's happening uh, at various scales. And so the, some of these scales are global, some of them are going to be at country level, some are right down to the household and individual level. You'll be hearing a bit of all of these. We're not only focused in Uganda and Nepal, but that's where most of the evidence you're going to hear today is, is associated with, but we do a lot of work and will be doing a lot more work in a lot of other countries. The three core, essentially core questions that we're tackling, have been tackling and will continue, is how do we invest cost effectively in agriculture or food-based programming uh, to have greater positive impacts on nutrition? What, how do we, what are the pathways that we should be focusing on? What can we learn empirically? <clears throat> nutrition governance is something that has gained a lot of attention recently, so how the process of implementing policies and complex programs matters as much as just the paper, the design. That it's, that it, how can we measure that? How can we learn from it? And then what else needs to be understood? Biological mechanisms is just shorthand for what health impacts or what trade-offs might be there that don't always allow better food, better diets to translate into improved nutrition. So big picture, global, global diets. Nutrition isn't just one thing. It's not just about stunting. We're also interested in wasting. We're also interested in non-communicable diseases. We have to understand that in poor developing countries, ischemic heart, heart disease, diabetes, and is also growing. And when you look at these 124 countries over three decades, a 100 kilocalorie per capita per day increase in the national food supply of these different foods has different effects. Now, cereal grains, more cereal grains in the food supply doesn't help stunting. It may or may not be positive for heart disease. It turns out more meat, dairy products, uh, fruits and veg are all positive to reducing stunting over time if that supply is increased. That's great. That's important. But not all of those have the same effect for preventing heart disease, chronic non-communicable diseases, and so on. This is pure association. But my point is that we need to focus on nutrient-rich foods. We need to focus on the diet of all people, which needs to be of a high quality. And we need to understand 
trade-offs in our policies that are promoting one or other, or what is the optimum diet that will address all forms of malnutrition as the base for making progress. Now this then takes us into multiple scales of analysis. So we can, we can look at what happens, what's the relationship between weather and climatic anomalies and agricultural systems, effects on uh, seasonality of birth, uh, which affects, of course, which is a, a, a proxy for mother's diets in many ways. <clears throat> and we're finding that it matters. When you're born matters. We can't do a whole lot about that. But we can find, find ways to offset the effects of climatic anomalies by ensuring that people have access to markets and are not isolated uh, in, 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 uh, uh, well, during their lives and during these uh, difficult periods. So we're, we're looking at then so climatic level, well, we have collaboration with NASA on this, looking at the big picture of weather and agriculture. Um, that then takes us to looking at key foods, as I was saying. <coughs> dietary diversity, proxy, shorthand for dietary quality in many cases, and we're finding, well, we have to be careful. Diet diversity scores, food frequency, food group scores are not always what they're made out to be. We need to understand which foods, actually which nutrient-rich foods are within that diverse diet. You can have di diverse diets in terms of food groups, but still not be consuming nutrient-rich foods. You can be consuming certain foods, but bioavailability constrains um, the outcomes. Uh, and we need to understand, are the outcomes offset by other forms of intervention, targeted nutrition interventions like supplementation and so on. So it's not just about diet. It's how diet interacts with health-seeking behaviors, services, and so on. If we promote production of, the, of these virtuous foods, nutrient-rich foods, do people actually eat more of them? Well, um, yeah, on the whole, we are finding evidence that promotion of certain kinds of foods does lead to more of those foods in the diet, and that's, that's good confirmation. We need that. Um, but some of, that may, some of the outcome that we want to see may be coming through income and health effects that are not directly diet <laughs> related, and we have to understand differences in context, and this is a, a key theme that is going to come out um, from many of, the, um, <clears throat> many of the presentations. One of the avenues towards diet diversity has been promoted is production diversity, <coughs> grow more diverse crops, grow, have more diverse <coughs> animal base. Um, well, does more production diversity actually translate into effective diet diversity? Uh, yeah, in some contexts. So again, you'll be hearing more about this, but we need to understand where does more production diversity mean less specialization and therefore less income from agriculture, or where does it actually mean it's a promotion of improved diets? It can be both, and it depends on access to markets, it depends on... Um, trade effects and self-reliance is not always uh, the ideal uh, that we would want to look for. Which then leads to how can we inform programming, complex programming of many different kinds. Well, it depends on the outcome. Nutrition, again, isn't one thing. And you can address certain nutrition outcomes in the short term, others in the long term, others at the seasonal level. We have to understand these different time frames. Um, we're actually seeing some effects that happen in children under 24 months, but not in children over 24 months. Uh, we're seeing some uh, changes, improvements uh, during a, a longer exposure to program uh, intervention and not in the short term. Uh, and sometimes we're seeing it in the short term and not in the long term. So this needs more teasing out. We have to understand that one of the key things that we're finding is exposure, the length, the duration of exposure, and what you're exposed to during a program period is critical to the quality of the intervention and what actually, what kind of outcome uh, derives. Now, this is not published yet. This is just ground truthing. We're not ascribing causality here. Uh, but one example of a complex integrated program in, in Nepal, Suahara, what we're seeing in terms of rates of change, that's all, we're, this is just snapshot. What are we seeing in terms of locations? We have sites across the country, those sites that are where Suahara is operating and those where they're not. And yes, I'm cherry picking the, the, these findings, but we can see that routine use of improved poultry feed, 
and so a higher place uh, locations where poultry production is promoted is significantly higher than in non-Sahara. Home garden ownership is the same. Whether they're visited by NGOs, the, the diet of, of women, and the change, the reduction in wasting and stunting, um, we can see changes. We can actually see differences. And we need to tease out what is attributable to a program, what is not, and what are the mechanisms that could be achieving. But this is suggestive, and it's kind of heading in the right direction. So I, I think we, we should be um, happy about that. So the large-scale programming issue is critical. Um, this is something we have to focus a lot more on in the coming um, five years. Large-scale programming, it does seem, there is increasing suggestive evidence that we're pulling out that says, well, yeah, actually, this can work. These integrations of agriculture with nutrition, with health, with other wash, with other forms of intervention... Yeah, this is nutrition sensitivity in action, but it makes it very hard to measure rigorously, empirically, but we're beginning to, to see the effects. But the impacts can take time, and the single-minded focus on universal large-scale coverage immediately on day one of a new project is A, really hard to do, to achieve, B, not always feasible to, to, uh, to manifest in terms of impacts, and C, how those programs, those activities complement whatever else is going on in a particular context is crucial. There can be actual trade-offs by uh, competing with government programs or negating other donor programs. And we have to understand USAID Feed the Future programs are not in an iso they're not isolated, they're not in a vacuum. We have to understand how they complement other things. Trade-offs, sustainability requires a lot of attention to protecting gains achieved. That's not always uh, the same as achieving immediate impact. Protecting those gains is critical. Uh, that requires much more attention to resilience. How can we make the gains resilient to climatic anomalies, to earthquakes, to droughts, to other forms of, of uh, negators? And that is an area we'll be focusing more on in the next five years. And finally, what are the confounders in the more in the biological mechanism space? Health effects? Yes, we're seeing things like indoor pollution, indoor smoke impairs child health and growth. Uh, we, yes, open defecation. Yes, every, that is increasingly being seen through not just global secondary data sets, but through our own uh, primary household level data sets. Hygiene, food safety, ha practices, all of those matter at the household level. And then, of course, mycotoxins, a big burning topic. And we have the Nutrition Lab has four country studies currently ongoing that are looking at the potential association between mycotoxins in the diet, birth outcomes, and child growth. So we are addressing all of these dom domains which do link to agriculture in various ways and, and livelihood. So it, the work we're doing maps out across the domains of the Feed the Future um, uh, framework uh, in a variety of ways. The, the, many of the um, publications that we have done so far, which are informing, uh, informing the dialogue with governments and, and donors, map out across these various pathways of the, fame, of the framework. And what we need to do in the coming five years is address a lot more of the specific policy, governance, quality of implementation, program design uh, and impact um, empirical information, as well as the intersection, which is where the potential health confounders come in and the, the, the direct interaction between resilience, value chains, markets, and the, 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 the point of intersection between those two. So in a sense, this is the mapping of what we have done so far and the mapping of where we are going in the future. This could not be done by any one of us alone. It's clearly a major undertaking, a major partnership, and I strongly acknowledge the valuable contribution of all of these partners, but especially the strong support that has come from Bureau of Food Security over all these years and, and Global Health and the missions uh, with whom we work. Uh, to make this kind of research possible. So I'll stop there and thank you.